So just to start us off, I'm Barbara Cassidy, if you don't know me. Um, Sexual Justice Now is a semester-long initiative that um, we're doing at the college, which is um, incorporating various events, um, arts, theater, um, panels, um, folks dismantling um, sexual assault, rape, sexual harassment. We think that John Jay should be the place that we're doing this. Um, so please check the calendar and, and come to the events. As you can see, it's up there. Oh, it's gone. Uh-oh. <laughs> anyway, tonight's event um, will be moderated by Katie Gentile. And Katie is a professor of gender studies and the chair of the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies at John Jay. She's the author of Creating Bodies, Eating Disorders as Self-Destructive Survival, and the Gradiva award-winning The Business of Being Made, The Temporalities of Reproductive Technologies in Psychoanalysis and Culture, both from Rutledge. She is editor of the Rutledge book series, Genders and Sexualities in Minds and Cultures, co-editor of the journal Studies in Gender and Sexuality, and on the editorial board of Women's Studies Quarterly. She has published numerous articles and book chapters on intimate partner violence, participatory action research, and the cultural and psychic production of temporalities around trauma, annihilation anxieties, reproduction, and fetal personhood. Her current research is on the use of the non-human in psychoanalytic treatment and on sexual boundary violations, institutional betrayal, and restorative justice. As a licensed psychologist, she's on the faculty of New York University's postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis and in private practice in New York City. So please welcome the panel and Katie to introduce the other panelists. Thank you, Barbara. Um, thank you for coming. I know uh, everybody's in the midst of lots of stuff, um, but the series is really important. Um, so let me start with uh, Paula, because she's on my, uh, <laughs> my cell phone, before my cell phone, uh, before I go back to the lock screen. Um, we're really lucky to have Paula Camila Casariz uh, here. She's a sophomore, and I just butchered her last name, and I'm really sorry. Uh, she's a sophomore here at John Jay, and um, she's, she's, she's very active. Uh, she's a law and society and a Spanish BA. Uh, double major, which is really important for all the students out there uh, to know you can double major. And she has a minor in interdisciplinary studies. <laughs> Yay. Uh, she's also uh, currently working with the Women's Center for Gender Justice, which if you don't know is right down the hall. L67. And, pardon? L67. L67. <laughs> and, um, and, and there she's a gender justice advocate, working specifically with the needs of the student parent population on campus. She is also a sophomore representative with the student council here at John Jay, where she brings attention to LBGTQ rights, undocumented student rights, and socio-professional advancements for the Latinx community. So thank you for joining us. <laughs> Hearing it all back, it sounds really pretentious now. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, you and me both. Huh? That's what a bio is. As I said, this is, this is politics. Bios are politics. And uh, we have had a history of many, many, many white men with really long bios. So we need to be proud of our bios. OK, Andrea. Andrea Stagg is the Deputy General Counsel at Barnard College. And before joining Barnard, she was counsel to three colleges within the State University of New York, representing them on all legal matters. Andrea also consulted with campuses system-wide on Title IX and campus safety. In 2013, she led SUNY's negotiation with the Office for Civil Rights in resolving a system-wide compliance review and managed its implementation. In 2014, she co-coordinated a working group of college professionals and outside experts who developed uniform policies on sexual and interpersonal violence prevention and response. These policies became the basis for the New York State Education Law 129B. Andrea graduated um, Phi Beta Kappa with high honors from Rutgers University and received her law degree from the George Washington University. So thank you. Um, so if you don't understand any of the lingo, 
uh, that we're talking about even in the bios, don't worry. You can either ask or we will clarify it as we go because I know, you know, sometimes it gets to be an alphabet soup. Um, B. Hansen, uh, who I've known for years actually, uh, yeah. when you were back at Safe Horizons, she came here a lot early uh, in. Um, uh, back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> uh, she's a national expert on addressing domestic and sexual violence. She currently serves as the executive director of the New York City Domestic Violence Task Force created by Mayor Bill de Blasio. Prior to that, she was acting director and principal deputy director of the U.S. Department of Justice Office on Violence Against Women from May 2011 to January 2017. In her role, she served as the liaison between the Department of Justice, federal, state, tribal, and international governments on matters involving violence against women. She was responsible for developing the department's legal and policy positions regarding the implementation of the Violence Against Women Act. During her tenure there, she successfully implemented major federal policy changes regarding domestic violence and sexual assault, including modernizing the definition of rape, which I hope some of you probably have learned in your classes why this was important, uh, imperative for human rights, uh, in the Federal Uniform Crime Report, providing national guidance to law enforcement on preventing, recognizing, and responding to gender bias and policing implementing evidence-based strategies to prevent and reduce domestic violence homicides, and playing a leadership role in the White House-led effort to prevent and respond to sexual assault on college campuses. So um, uh, she previously was chief program officer for Safe Horizon, which is when we met. And before that, she was, client, uh, she was director of client services at the New York City Anti-Violence Project, which, uh, if you don't know that, is one of the largest mm -hmm the largest national serving uh, LBGTQ um, uh, project in the United States. Um, so welcome. Thank you. Um, Hannah Pennington is the New York Assistant Commissioner, Policy and Training Policy Director for the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence. Um, previously, she worked at Sanctuary for Families mm -hmm. and the Center for Battered Women's Legal Services in New York and the Bronx Legal Director. Um, thank you, Hannah. Thank you. <laughs> but you found some stuff on me. Yeah. <laughs> not, not what I said. Oh, was it? No, but that's okay. Oh, that's yeah. weird. Oh, I thought I cut and pasted from your email. No, but that's all pretty accurate. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, <laughs> it's all relatively there. Yeah, it's pretty much there. All right, that's the downside of bio. Uh, so the, obviously we have a panel here of people who have done this work for years, who are on the ground floor of implementing the way Title IX operates now. And um, so I'm going to turn to Andrea right now quickly to, to talk about Title IX, because many of you may not even uh, fully grasp why it's there, what it does, and, and how it's come to, and you're shaking your head. So yes, your, your questions will be answered. Okay, just, just a note that my, the college I work at now, Barnard College, has MOUs both with Sanctuary for Families and with AVP, the Anti-Balance Project, so it's really exciting the way that schools now are really working on partnering with these local services and amazing organizations that are available, and it's a great partnership. I mean, what, what's we, an we MOU? Uh, Memorandum of <laughs> Understanding, a legal agreement um, of cooperation. So um, I could talk about Title IX all day, but we don't have all day, so I'll tell you what I think you should know. Um, the law was passed in 1972, uh, it's, and we're talking about really 37 words that, said, that prohibit sex discrimination at, in educational programs and activities. What is an educational program or activity? pretty much everything a school does. And I say school because Title IX applies also to in the K through 12 context, which I'm sure you're thinking, that's weird. I never heard about it until college. Not so weird. Your, your, your district was not thinking about it. They probably didn't have a designated Title IX coordinator at the time. Districts are still moving to make, uh, to make that happen. Um, so it applies also in the college context, obviously. So what it means is that schools have an obligation to prevent sex discrimination. 
Okay, and then if it happens, because we can't do everything, we're not superhuman, we wish we could, that's the goal of all of us, right? Prevent sex discrimination. If we can't do it, we need to respond promptly and equitably when it occurs, when we're aware of it, and that's a whole other thing, when we know or should have known, right? And then we need to remedy the effects and limit the effects. So that all, when you unpack it, which we can't right now, but it all involves a lot of different steps and best practices and what we could do and should do, depending on facts, but you know, pretty much you have to have established grievance procedures you have to have an investigation process it shouldn't be biased you should you know have published timelines so people understand what's going on you should have great support services in place or a way to find them or partner with local organizations to make those available to students you should have interim measures available um, and you should have some some kind of grievance procedure where you can adjudicate a complaint in some way um, so so we talked about that we have the law there's also regulations and the bulk of what um, people are talk about is guidance, and the guidance is supposed to explain in plainer language, ostensibly, right? Like maybe it's plainer language, depends what you think. Um, what the law, like really what you're supposed to be doing. So there was major guidance in 2001, and that's still in effect today. But And it's really, the 2001 guidance comes from um, the, the federal office that enforces Title IX is the Office for Civil Rights in the Department of Education. So they are the ones who enforce Title IX, which means that they issue the guidance, they get complaints from students about schools, and then they investigate them or don't, depending on if they think they hold any water upon first review. And they also can do compliance reviews where they just kind of go out and investigate even without a pending complaint, or they look at something broader than the complaint. Um, and so we had we had huge guidance in 2001 about sexual harassment um, that didn't really talk about sexual violence and um, wasn't focused on peers necessarily. And then in 2011, there was major guidance that really is why I think everyone is here now. It raised so much awareness um, about peer sexual violence and it was mostly it was focused in the college context but it applied also the same to K through 12 and the there it had a companion guidance called with which was a title 9 Q&A three years later and both of those have since been rescinded but I just don't think you can unring that bell. We know now what we didn't know before. Schools have taken steps that they never took before. So we can talk more, maybe later, <laughs> about the me like whether it's really meaningful that it was rescinded or how meaningful it really is like operationally at an institution. And it may be specific on your institution and which state you're in, in New York, in New York City especially, we're in a pretty good place. Um, but yeah, those were rescinded more recently in this administration, and they issued interim guidance in fall 2017. And we're, I'm really, any day now this spring, we're going to see um, proposed proposed guidance from this administration. So we learn, so we have the law, we have regulation, we have this guidance, and then we have something very informal, um, which is um, you know enforcement information. So we have, we know what OCR, you know, the Office for Civil Rights, which enforces Title IX, we know what they said to Fordham at the end of their complaint about. XYZ, and we kind of could look at it and learn from it. The same way when you learn about anything that anyone did that ends up in the news, you know, what 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 they do wrong and what can we learn from it is, is what we get from those enforcement. And it's also, you can really foreshadow what's coming sometimes even in, in, in guidance from looking at uh, past compliance reviews or complaint resolution. So we learn a lot about, C and, and that's all online at OCR's website, so you can see, you know, what they've enforced lately and what the school allegedly did wrong and what they're going to do to correct it. And it can help schools figure out, okay, how do we, what do we do about that here? Are we doing this well? What does our policy say? Um, what kind of training are we doing? So that's pretty much Title IX in five minutes. Thank you. You're welcome. That was great. <laughs> that was great. Oh, and sex discrimination is like very, very broad. Verbal, sexual violence, you know, pay disparity, you know, this faculty member gets a semester off if they give birth to a child. This one who's becoming a parent by adoption or is the male partner, gets no sabbatical, you know, it's, it, it's anything that involves sex discrimination. But we're, we're talking about sexual violence here. Just want to make that clear. Right, right. Yeah. Right. And how does it come, because it wasn't always used in this context, right? So the history of, because it, it, it spurns the Dear Colleague, it, it, it catalyzes the Dear Colleague letter, right? It, it starts being used by students at Yale, Harvard, which one, I can't remember. I think it was Yale. Yale? Yeah, okay. Was first, yeah. And they leverage Title IX 
as a way, because their school was doing nothing for them uh, to stop massive harassment of the female freshman students. And so Title IX actually was the first way to get it actually nationally listened to. It was effective, in other words. Mm -hmm. So it's also not surprising that it was one of the first things to be rescinded, unfortunately. But, um, but yeah, and then the Dear Colleague letter, uh, which you were part of. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Comes yeah. in. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I think, you know, and I think there's been so many. Is this on or do I have to do anything? No. Um, I don't have to do anything. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, the, the, actually, the Dear Colleague letter came out like a month after I started working in the Obama administration. And, um, and you know, the whole idea was that, that there was organizing that was happening on some college campuses and looking at Title IX as it relates to sexual violence and expanding it beyond sexual harassment. Um, and conversations happening within the Department of Education and within the Department of Justice. And, you know, I think part of, and, and looking at the overall administration at that time, where you have Joe Biden, who was the senator who was behind passing the Violence Against Women Act in 1994, which was really the first big federal piece of legislation um, that, that provided resources to address. Um, sexual violence and domestic violence and, and, and stalking. Um, and when, when he became the vice president, it created this new position of a White House advisor on violence against women. And, um, and, uh, and then there was a lot more communication between my office, which was in the Department of Justice, and the White House in terms of how do we, you know, how do we put more um, emphasis and energy and expand the work that we're doing to address um, sexual violence and, and domestic violence. And so, um, you know, I, I think the perception from the administration side was that that Dear Colleague letter in, 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 that was released in, in April 2011 basically just said that, that just reiterated that guidance from 2001 and saying when you talk about sexual harassment, that duh, it also includes sexual assault and rape. And so, so it wasn't really, it was, it was more of making clear that sexual violence uh, was incorporated as part of sexual harassment and that universities and colleges had a responsibility to respond. Um, and you know, you look at, you know, you look at the, the statistics around it that, that 20% of, of female students and 6% of male students will be raped or sexually assaulted at some point in their college career. Um, that, we, that we know that only, depending on the study you look at, like 4% to 20% of those rapes or sexual assaults are actually reported to law enforcement. Um, that only 16% of, of rape and sexual assault victims were actually seeking victim services. So we had, a huge number of, of mostly women and some men um, who, were, who were sexually assaulted on college campuses and there was no recourse for them or they felt that there was no recourse for them. They didn't know what recourse was out there and so ended up um, uh, people dropping out of school, um, uh, offenders getting away with it and and the message that we send as institutions is that this is okay because if offenders are able to 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 rape and sexually assault people without having any recourse whatsoever it's sending that message that that that's okay so um, you know so the idea is so that was the idea behind the 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 dear the dear colleague letter and then um, later on, a, a White House task force was put together, a White House task force to protect students from sexual assault. And, and that was launched um, in January of, of 2014. And I was at the, at the launch event. And you know, we had a, a, a president who spoke for 20 minutes about sexual assault and how horrible sexual assault is and how that impacts survivors and victims and families and, and, you know, and has a huge impact on people through their whole life. Uh, and a vice president who said the same thing, which is just you know incredibly frustrating to think that you know that sentiment from leadership um, isn't there anymore, and and how important that that is. And so um, the task force uh, was established to kind of come up with some additional tools and resources for universities, because I think what was also happening at that time is campuses across the country were totally freaking out about oh my god, what does this mean? We need to do, and and we're concerned about 
the Department of Education come in and find and and investigating their universities. So, so we were coming together to come up with some resources to uh, to give to colleges and universities. So we have some guidance about how to connect between campus law enforcement or campus security and local law enforcement. Um, we talked about doing uh, campus climate surveys, and I don't know if. if if mm -hmm. stuff happens here at John Jay, but but um, did a validation of a of a campus climate survey, so students, so universities could use that to look at, you know, what do students know about sexual violence on college campus? What's the what's the prevalence that 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 students are saying that they're reporting as opposed to what gets reported to law enforcement or security? Because we know that that's so much less. Um, you know how do how do um, how do we attend to the particular needs in our in our community? So those surveys, um, and then talking about bystander and prevention messages, and how do we make sure that we're talking about those not just one time for incoming students, but consistency throughout throughout universities and providing some evidence based programming and some um, uh, of, of what's available. So that was kind of the idea of what we we're doing to try to provide some support. And plus, the Office of Violence Against Women, we gave out, first there was $40 million a year and then up to almost $80 million a year to universities to help them implement some of these um, measures in their, in their universities. Yeah, and, and I will say, at the time I was director of the Women's Center here, which, just to put this in context, when she says how underreported rape was, I was the identified counselor for students who had had any experience of rape, sexual assault, domestic violence, et cetera, et cetera, just because I worked in the Women's Center, was the director of it. And I would say in 11 years, two students, two, yeah. reported, two. Um, so when we talk about how, how underreported it is, it's really significant mm -hmm. that only two reported um, to the, the you know, law enforcement. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, I just wanted to reinforce that. And also the thing about the Title IX that I thought was brilliant myself, just as someone who's written about it and also uh, experienced the shift, let's say, from pre-Dear uh, Colleague to after, is the, the atmosphere. Because I don't think a lot of the laws don't address the atmosphere, the mm -hmm. atmosphere of the campus. The campus climate survey uh, becomes key. Because if you think about it, you know, there's one thing in terms of being harassed, uh, maybe in the hall. It's another thing to hear the the kind of what you're what you what students are talking about, the way maybe students talk about women or uh, or LBGTQ students, and to hear that harassment that isn't at you, but you get that you get the hint about what it means. And so the idea of having an that the college was responsible for its atmosphere, mm -hmm. I thought was was a big. Uh, jump from just like patrolling people's behaviors to actually having to take responsibility for um, whether students felt welcome in that way. Yeah. What? Yeah. Oh, well, Anyone want to um, add anything? Well, uh, I personally also work at the Women's Center for Gender Justice, and I can tell you that it's 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 changed very, very drastically since the rescinding of the Dear Colleague letter because there was obviously a lot of confusion and uh, like I also personally had a lot of questions even though I do work a lot with like gender equity and Title IX and um, a lot of the students, they would just inquire but not inquire like for themselves, they would just inquire for like past cases in the past, like things that they just like thought of or something that has happened in the past that they wanted to know what they could do about it now. But it's, it, it's obviously changed, and like there's still a lot of things that need to be worked on. And um, with the, in the context of this specific college, due to the fact that we are a commuter school, and we are in the CUNY system, there's this thing called reportable geography, or all, all that's like all around of all, our buildings. And I don't think it includes the dorms, which are on 34th at, uh, on 34th Street, um, that are for John Jay. That um, do, it kind of limits what people can actually say and what people can actually do and the, the emotions that people are allowed to have when things like this happen because yeah you can um, when you put things under the umbrella of like sexual harassment it becomes overly broad and like things become overly like convoluted and with with this reportable geography that doesn't that limits people and like what they can say and like the things that they can do about anything that they want to it it kind of like closes people's doors and then they feel like they, they can't and then they kind of choose to move on, which is not something that I want to continue to perpetuate, especially in a place of higher education. The experience that people have and the experience that students have should be a good one. And 
we need to make sure that we address all issues and all issues that happen here, especially when it comes to sexual harassment, intimate partner violence, and stuff like that, because there's a lot of different communities on campus that are not visible, especially myself with my work um, that I do specifically with student parents on campus is that I formed a support group where um, a lot of uh, student parents uh, came and talked about intimate partner violence and how it's not addressed for student parents and how it's not necessarily something that people can be extremely open about because in a commuter school, in the CUNY system, that's not necessarily who we're catering to. We're catering to people who are gonna come here, be active and like full-time students that are here to like continue to build the foundation that we have at John Jay and then move on and then continue to do that. and then. It's kind of like this filtering process of just doing that with a lot of people that come in. And I think that it's more important that we are having these conversations now. And I'm actually very happy to see a lot of students here. And I'm actually, yay. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that's the whole spiel that I had to give. Yeah, I mean, I would piggyback on what, I mean, first of all, I would say it's I think amazing that you're here to learn more about Title IX. I feel like I say this about a lot of things. Please heard me say this people often throw around terms and they don't really know what they're talking about. Like people always talk about Title IX, but then they never even like look to see what, did, what are we even talking about? <laughs> yeah. Or sexual harassment, like what is sexual harassment? What is sexual abuse? What is sexual violence? What is intimate partner violence? So kudos to you for being here. Um, but I do think that, um, so I'm, I oversee the Policy and Training Institute at the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence, and so our work is really rooted in intimate partner violence, even though the name of it is domestic violence. Um, oh, sure, yeah. Um, but I think something that I would say in terms of sort of the barriers that mm -hmm. you're talking about is that we don't often talk about intimate partner violence. So I'm actually, and I know why, because you work at the Women's Center. And we tend to hire those people too. We've hired two gender justice advocates in the last six weeks, so just saying. Wow. <laughs> um, because I think in this conversation, obviously sexual violence um, is so prevalent, but so is intimate partner violence. And I feel like that being included within Title IX, and that goes for, you know, we do a lot of work in my office with the New York City school system. Similarly, people talk about sexual violence, but Title IX, which applies to K through 12, also applies to dating violence between students. So thank you for saying that. Um, and I think also, um, you know, I think that Andrew is right, that we're lucky we're in New York City, there's a lot going on, but there's still so much more that we can do, and that's sort of where I come in and have had the honor to work with a lot of people at John Jay who are a really strong part of the CUNY system on this, but there's so much more that we as a city can do to support private and public campuses and address what you're talking about, Paula, that it's not, I and mean, we do trainings with community schools all the time, and it's, they, I don't feel like people can identify with the stories that they're seeing in the media, so they may not know that they can get help, or even advocates, like another thing that we've, um, in my prior role uh, before our, um, being at the central office, at the mayor's office, I oversaw saw one of our family justice centers, and we don't see a lot of students from CUNY at the family justice centers, because I don't think that they know that those services exist for them. And then the other thing is that I don't think advocates understand Title IX and know that they can advocate for really important academic mm -hmm. accommodations. Like, I spent time talking with different Title IX coordinators at CUNY campuses who were happily ready to help us help a, help a client who needed mm -hmm. a waiver for a class or you know something mm -hmm. happened and so I think part of um, the barriers even just making sure that people know what their rights are and that they can actually access it obviously once they do sometimes <laughs> more barriers present themselves but I think uh, be you know even just spreading the word that these that people have these rights, that these services exist, that you can go to the Women's Center, that you can talk to someone confidentially is, is really important. Yeah, I think that with that, there's also a lot of like cultural bar barriers that are extremely prevalent in our society, especially since we are in New York City where our uh, immensely diverse and especially this is a Hispanic serving institution. And I think that with a lot of that, there's still a, lo a lot of cultural barriers and a lot of you know, very, very strong barriers rooted in religion and whatever it is that you choose to identify yourself with that still don't allow for people to have this open space of talking about this stuff, which I think should, is still, we're still working to address it, so stay tuned. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
So what do you think, I mean, we were talking about this a little before, but there's something about the, you know, you said Title IX is K through 12, yet if students hear about it, they're apt to hear about it only in college. Mm -hmm. So what are the ramifications of this? What do, you know? I think we all agreed that we wish there was better <laughs> consent education, healthy relationship training, laying that groundwork much, much before orientation at college. So we all wish yeah. that that was in high school, in middle school. Yeah, yeah so there, there's I, I have a lot to say about this, because I care about Title IX, but I care even more about uh, youth prevention um, around intimate partner violence and sexual violence. Um, and I think that actually the extreme example of what we were talking about um, that I said to be on the train right up here is um, there's some really, really interesting work that you probably know about, Andrea, the SHIFT study um, that's looking at um, a really intensive look at Barnard and Columbia students to look at the prevalence of sexual violence um, and to learn more about sort of what happened to students before they got to campus, when they're on campus, and one of the investigators on the study said that it should absolutely be a prerequisite for every university that students have received comprehensive sex education be to get into college, mm -hmm. which is sort of an extreme thing to say, which is dumb that that's extreme because mm -hmm. Obviously, like every young person who's going to go to a college campus should have sex education. Um, yeah. It should be common core. I'll take the um, SAT or the ACT. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sex ed. yeah. So, um, so, but we, we are doing some work in that area and recognizing not only that we need to do the prevention, but we have to do it with younger and younger students. And one of the task force um, recommendations from last year that I'm working on B with is this project called Early RAP, which is a, a relationship abuse prevention pro program specifically for middle schoolers. And middle schoolers, by the way, have the worst rates of getting health education, not even talking about sex education, but health education. Like, you have to get one semester of um, health education by the time you graduate middle school, and 60% of students leave middle school before going to high school and did not get that one semester of health education, mm -hmm. which means they're not getting sex education. Um, and they just tend to have less resources around this kind of programming, so we're gonna have community educators going into 128 middle schools to do healthy relationship education and to do consent workshops about navigating healthy sexual relationships, which is really, exciting and also there is um, there was a bill passed last year that the mayor um, convened a sex ed task force which I sit on along with um, Jennifer Hirsch from the shift research and a lot of other people educators who are doing work on the ground a lot of students which has been really fantastic and I was heartened that once we sat down as at this task force I thought sort of thought I was gonna have to sort of explain why it was so important that people that do the work I do were there, but I didn't need to because I think that really people understand that in order to work on sexual violence prevention, we actually have to include that as we think about comprehensive sex education, which is exciting. I think people mm -hmm. understand that more than they did even just a few years ago. Yeah. Okay. yeah. What are the barriers to that, though? Because it seems like we all understand it, yet it somehow seems it doesn't happen. Yeah, so the barriers, and then I'll stop talking. I mean, I could talk for five well, we hours all, about yeah, the barriers. Yeah, yeah. But to the, but I, I thought you were saying to comprehensive sex yes, education. Yes, no, yes, oh I my am. God. Like, <laughs> well, first of all, the state of New York doesn't require sex education. Um, it's not a requirement. Health education is a requirement. Sex education is not a requirement. So sex um, is not part of health. It's not part of health as far as the state is concerned. <laughs> the city does require sex education in middle school and high school, not in grade school, although the sex ed task force may recommend recommend something about uh, K through uh, fifth grade. So I think that's a huge bear because it's not a requirement and everything. And also, frankly, and B knows this because we, I bemoan this all the time. I mean, there's a million school children in New York City. There's so many things being piled onto schools every day and to be able to add something to the list that the principals of these schools have to get their students. It's, it's, there's just, the barriers are endless, but I think if you can, work to create shifts in, in individual school cultures around these things and around wellness and around sex education and you bring parents. I mean, I think there's ways to do it, but it's super labor intensive and it will take time. Um, so yeah, but I could talk about the barriers forever. I'm sure others have thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they, I mean, you know, 
I think one of the things that we don't think about is just the impact of sexual violence on people's, on you know, kids' ability to function in school. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that the you know the greatest likelihood of being sexually assaulted as an adult is if you were sexually assaulted as a child. And so, you know, and we know that if if we don't. And with intervention, we can stop that pattern from happening. So the idea of identifying sexual violence as a young age as we could possibly do, how can we prevent it? Um, you know, and that's around educating everybody. That's educating whole families about about sexual violence and and how that connects to other things. I mean, even you know, looking at domestic violence, like the the. The, the connection between mass shooting and domestic violence, that all of the mass shooters and the high percentage of them who've ex who, who were offenders of domestic violence prior to that, you know, those connections need to be made in terms of how we, how we elevate and respond to sexual violence and domestic violence and prevent that as early as we can. Yeah. Did you want to say anything? <laughs> I mean, I, I, when I've talked with, there's someone who does a lot of training in partnership with SUNY from the New York State Office for the Prevention of Domestic Violence, and he talks about how when he was a cop and before he joined OPDV, there was a time where, you know, you're in a small town, you're a police officer, so you get a call about domestic disturbance, you show up, you can tell it's a domestic violence incident, and you just kind of like talk everyone down, make sure everyone's cooled off, and then you go home and, you know, and, ha and, and working toward this cultural shift of like domestic violence is not a shame it's a crime and it should be treated like a crime and they have, you know, OPTV has bumper stickers that say that like oh it says you know domestic violence is a shame and then it's crossed out and it says crime and it's like you know shifting this culture and you think about you know how can we how can we change our culture and something schools are thinking about colleges are thinking about and we want we'd love for high schools and middle schools to think about um, and we and you know we always say in co at college like what if you're not in college? We want you to still be safe. We want you to still be safe if you choose not to go to college. We want you to be safe before you get to us and after you leave us. So how can we do that? Um, and if you never come to us at all, so how can we do that? How can we work to change our culture so people you know, can, can behave appropriately and understand that something's not a shame, it's a crime, and you know, be effective, safe bystanders, um, have the tools to do that, and that's what we're looking to do. Well, and that brings up a good point because, a yes, not everyone goes to college, but the people who are most most um, sexually harassed are, in fact, people in service industries, who may or may not be going to college. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you're not, this is a societal, obviously, issue to train to to um, teach people early um, when they're a captive audience. When they're a captive mm -hmm. audience, yeah. yeah. And when, um, yeah. And I think the other thing you're talking about is bringing in, you know, this idea that uh, domestic violence will get attention if it's, you know, the mass shooter connection. It's like it's such a shame that sh this is a shame. I mean, I get <laughs> that you have to connect that to make domestic violence important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, but it is kind of one of the things that I've often said in classes too to try to get like somebody to wake up. Um, about the importance of domestic violence. Um, but we've changed our culture before, right? It used to be that the police officer would just drive behind someone who was drunk until they got home safe. And now you'll get arrested for a DUI. And it's, it's like weird to think about that that was, that was normal, but that was what was normal. It was normal to not wear a seatbelt. Now you'll get a ticket. You know, a lot of things change. Culture changes. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we do have a time constraint now. It may or may, uh, so I want to open it up at this point for questions from the audience. Um, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so allowed. has any, anything really changed now with the current administration and their take on Title IX? Is, is there any real change that's going on in colleges? I mean, I think it'll depend on the college, right? So um, enforcement has changed from the Office for Civil Rights, that's for sure. I'm sure enforcement has changed. They said they've, they're going to enforce open cases that are pending with the standards that were in place when the complaint was opened. So that makes sense. Um, I, I mean, anecdotally, I think it's been slow. We haven't seen a lot of resolutions coming out. Um, not that they were so speedy before, but it's not like they're just administratively closing lots of cases left and right. We're not seeing that. Um, so I think enforcement will change, but a lot of colleges are not looking to make major changes in New York. Um, and I think it's because of Enough is Enough, Article 129B, which is part of our education law, um, passed a couple years ago. And it codifies some of the best practices that came out of 
the Dear Colleague letter and its aftermath, and it also codifies into state law a lot of uh, the VAWA amendments to Cleary, so the Violence Against Women Act amendments to the Cleary Act from uh, you know 2013, and then the 15 were the um, or 2014 the regulations. Yeah. The regulations were very detailed and really helpful. And the Cleary Act, I think, is what Paula was talking about when she was talking about reportable geography, which is like I was like, oh, Cleary. Right. Um, the Clear Act is a crime counting and disclosure law. It's supposed to be a consumer protection law for y'all and your parents and whoever cares about you before you go to school. So they should have looked up, you know, John Jay annual security report, you know, 20, 2015 and seen, you know, what were the crimes in that reportable geography. It's 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 not really telling you how safe a campus is. That's the idea. I think it. I think it can be great. I think it has some flaws. But what was really interesting about the VAWA amendments to Cleary is, for the first time, it said, "Okay, you're counting, you're disclosing. Great, um, you're sending warnings, right? Emergency alerts, that kind of thing." But for the first time in 13, and then in, through the regulations, more detail, they said, you're, "We're going to talk more about how you prevent and how you respond, including." You know the requirement that we do ongoing primary and then ongoing prevention and awareness campaigns. Um, so that's really it was huge for the first time. Cleary was saying we're not just going to look back and count and tell you what we what happened or what was reported. We're going to tell you we're going to require all of this kind of training and notice um, and, and really about how your school needs to behave and respond and investigate when uh, a report of domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, or sexual assault is reported. So it, it, gets, it overlaps with Title IX because it relates to sexual violence. Um, and, and, and 129B codifies a lot of what's in, what's in uh, those amendments. Yeah, for the, for the recording. Would you, would you comment on um, the education and awareness plan uh, program that you, it's ongoing, it's supposed to be ongoing, um, but as it relates to two key groups, one, administrators mm -hmm. and how they devote resources to address this right. or the lack of resources, mm -hmm. and number two, the men. Um, we know men can be victims mm -hmm. of violence, sexual violence, but so often, sadly, they are the perpetrators. And how do you get other men to be the bystanders, to intervene and to um, try to do the right thing? I mean, so there's, a, there's a lot I'm sure that everyone can say. I'm just going to note two things from the New York State education law that, that certainly reach men, whether, because they, um, the, so 129B requires that colleges can um, mandate training, so that you offer training to everybody, and that's in the VAWA regula regulations as well. So you, Cleary, you're complying with Cleary, you're offering training to everybody, but it's not required that they attend and check a box, it's just you offer it. But 129B went further and said, who, you know who must complete training? Athletes, your student athletes, and your student leaders. And you have some flexibility to decide what a leader is. If you have a group that has like a seven person exec board, you can kind of choose you know, who's, who's what. Um, so your student leader. So we know, and, and there's a reason why. And you know, I had coaches saying to me, and you know, athletic directors, like, you think the athletes are the perpetrators? And we said, no, we think they are leaders. And they are here. They're engaged, they are on campus, they're spending a lot of time with each other. Um, and with other and with other people, they're on campus during breaks in the summer, early, late, you know, traveling on overnight trips, all kinds of things. So we think they're around. We think they're leaders. We think they serve as mentors. We think people talk to them and look up to them, and we want them to have this information. It is vital they have this information. So um, that's now it's in the law that all student leaders, student athletes, uh, and st student leaders of all clubs and organizations recognize clubs and organizations, um, which is its own thing. And then and student athletes ha must complete the training. And that's, it's just, it's a way that a lot of schools have found to engage men and working with, you know, working with organizations. I know a lot of SUNY campuses work with the One Love Foundation and, you know, trying to engage men. They have these escalation workshops which train students to then do trainings. Um, and it's, you know, they're finding, they're, they find ways. And I think what's important about this, about the education efforts that you have to make under the law is they need to be meaningful. So if you offer a brown bag lunch every month and no one comes, are you really doing training? Because when you see that no one's coming, you need to switch it up. You, need, you know, and your one-time online training is not going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, your brown bag, no one comes to, isn't going to do it. You need to, you need to do different things. You need to try different things. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in other resources, uh, as a. Uh, place called the Center for Creating, uh, for Changing Our Campus Culture, and it's um, 
changingourcampus.org. And so this was created out of technical assistance from the Office on Violence Against Women. It houses all of the not alone reports and everything from the Obama administration. Um, and has um, one of the documents that it has is uh, an evaluation that um, Vicki Banyard from the University of New Hampshire did on uh, effective bystander interventions. Um, so, and there's some work there that they're doing around looking at, at uh, groups for men, because it's really, like you said, you know, really, really critical. Um, also, a call to men has a, has a, a, a curriculum called Live Respect. Um, which they've done a lot of training uh, with uh, college campuses, high schools. Um, the NFL has done a lot of that training. So there's there's stuff out there um, that 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 you can use. Yeah, and I would just add to that that I think so. I oversee a domestic violence training team and also the Healthy Relationship Training Academy of New York City, um, which is one of the ways there's. Through both of those, we've partnered with the Women's Center and the Gender Justice Advocates. Um, we try to make sure that our training and our workshops make the points that you're talking about in terms of the fact that you know men can be victims and are victims, and using um, gender-neutral language. Um, and we also try to engage men as educators. Um, and so I, everywhere I go, I say, and actually we have an open um, peer educator position um, in our academy. We've grown by leaps and bounds the last couple of years. And we don't get a lot of applications from young men, um, which won't surprise a lot of people. Um, but I think it's really important for um, young men to have um, people they can look up to. And I think the Live Respect curricula um, that is, is facilitated with even middle school um, and actually young men and young women, which is important too. Like you can do it both ways. Um, so that's just another, I think, I think it's on all of our minds um, and I think it's important. Um, but we do, we, we, I mean, many of us have been doing this work for a really long time and you know, you, you definitely need to bring people into the fold and it's, it's a challenge. It's been a challenge of the work that we do. So if you have ideas, you can always tell us. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's also an example of why it needs to be done young, too, because obviously yeah. toxic masculinity needs to be, you yeah. can't just like suddenly get to college and be told, oh, guess what? You know, you've got to switch up your, yeah. you know, that's the way you're doing your gender. That, that it's, it's not fair. Yeah. It's really not fair to the men or the women. So, uh, and, and certainly, you know, obviously it's going to also make it a lot easier for gender nonconforming and trans students to have a campus where students are coming who have had a background in this, who have had opportunities to work with really uh, caring, nurturing, you know, male identified teachers mm -hmm. in K through six, you know. And because of those gender issues, I think we also always think about creating safe spaces for young men to talk about these issues because of exactly what Professor yeah. Gentile is saying about expecting people to just, you know, switch a switch a um, a light switch and and that that's going to fix the problem. So, but it's a really good question. Yeah. For the context of John Jay, uh, I think that uh, the Women's Center for Gender Justice and the Urban Male Initiative we work really really well together to make sure that there's room for men and men identified individuals to come and like they talk about a lot of what they need to talk about whatever that is and we do that through having our sister circle and our guide code seminars where people just come in and they they pick a topic out of a hat and then they're like all right we're going to talk about hyper masculinity today we're going to talk about gender norms and i think that giving people that space and that like s sort of like agency to a certain expect uh, extent uh, allows for these conversations to be had of course there are certain things that like need to be done that need to prepare people a lot further because going back to uh, what was said about the the title nine trainings that uh, occur here for student leaders i've personally i've i've had like about 12 title nine trainings because i'm a very active student leader on campus and whenever i talk to people i'm like oh yeah i i have these title nine trainings people dead in the face they have no idea what it is that i'm talking about and what it means that i'm having these trainings and why i'm having these trainings and why we try to bring like bring me the bystander to, to mm -hmm. John Jay and they don't see the relevance of why we need to have it because they're like, oh, I'm just going to college. There's nothing else that I need to do besides contribute to the academia that it's here and then go home. They don't realize that this is a lived experience and the experiences you have here you will carry throughout um, your entire life. 
And the same goes with like the preparation uh, from pre-K to all the way to 12. The experiences that you have in middle school, high school, and like even in elementary school mm -hmm. will carry out through the, the, the rest of your life and you will continue to perpetuate those things in every environment that you're in. And if you don't give people that space and that agency and that autonomy to like voice their opinions and even have questions, then what are you actually doing as an institution? And what are you trying to fix? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Paula, you're so awesome. <laughs> um, my name is Bettina. Um, so I think like everybody here, you know, I obviously agree that change needs to happen and we want to work together to make it happen on campuses and in other in schools. Um, the question is how do we do it and what exactly do we want, to, how do we want to accomplish this? Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder, <clears throat> whether we can broaden our horizons a little bit in thinking about this. Um, we have two, what are two of the biggest movements, the two biggest movements right now are hashtag me too and hashtag never again. They both concern education and they both concern um, uh, violence. Um, and the two are oftentimes related, gun violence and sexual violence are oftentimes related. I would even broaden this uh, in, in um, thinking about safety uh, overall for educational environments. So you said it starts with K. I have no idea that there was Title IX for K um, <laughs> through 12. But yeah, so why don't we think about safety for educational environments and what that means. And we could un include under that umbrella um, gun violence, uh, sexual violence, um, Food, healthy food, nutritional, I mean healthy nutrition in schools, which also, and then come up with some sort of a strategy or plan, maybe I'm dreaming, um, uh, of uh, how do we, um, how do we mobilize campuses uh, and students to actually be proud of their campuses and in, in, a, in a sense compete uh, with other colleges and schools on which one is the healthiest, the safest campus in the, you know, in the land. Um, so I, I just, I'm, I'm curious as to what you think about just having an overall umbrella of safe campuses and kind of, you know, starting a huge campaign um, with that and then think about how we can institutionalize this um, in every educational facility, uh, bringing it into the classroom, integrating it into the classroom and starting at K actually, where education about these issues has to start just being in a safe environment. When you're in school, you're safe. You're safe from gun violence, you're safe from sexual violence, you're safe from malnutrition, you're safe from whatever, anything else. Well, I think one thing that we have to be very intersectional because we know that uh, kids of color aren't safe in school. They often aren't even safe from their teachers or the disciplinary structure, which calls them out very disproportionately. So let's add hashtag Black Lives Matter and other things really do you know, the whole thing. Because we also know women of color are often most stopped. Cisgender women of color and trans women of color are most apt to get attacked. So it is really important. Yeah, the Department of Education has a program that is, there's a lot of programs they have that people don't know about because it's such a large system. Um, and it's through the Office of School Wellness Programs. They have wellness councils at schools. And I think to answer your question, one of the things you need is resources to be able to do these things. And you have to have staff that can focus on them. But it is a structure that I think if it could be, if there were resources, and there should be, to create more councils, it's sort of bringing in the idea behind it is there has to be, the principal has to be on it. There has to be students on the council. There have to be parents. The school safety agent, like everybody has to come together and come up with a plan. Like how, and, and their wellness definition absolutely includes safety in all respects, including from domestic violence, from teen dating violence, um, but it also includes nutrition and physical education. In fact, the physical education system in the city has actually gotten so much better than it was. It doesn't seem like it always, but they put a ton of resources into making sure that these physical education requirements were done and they use different physical, physical education councils to do it. So I do think that there are ways at the school level that mm -hmm. you can, but you do, you need resources and you need, um, you need teachers not to have to wear like another hat. Like you have to identify some people who have 
support to be able to, to do it. But I, I think there's some models out there that, that, that are like what you're talking about. And I know we've been talking about it in terms of sex education because if that wellness council can make it be a part of that school's Mm. sort of ethos that like healthy sexual um, relationships is mm. part of what they teach everybody across the spectrum in the school community, um, you could make a lot of difference. And we've seen a lot of change in New York. I mean, just being a resident, I see a lot of change the past couple years in New York City schools, just like most recently, free, brec free lunch. Breakfast was free, and lunch was like really a kind of a, a low amount, right? It wasn't, it wasn't prohibitively expensive you know, in my opinion, but, but it was still something. And then you still, to get free lunch or reduced lunch, you have to fill out a form, parents have to sign it, you have to fill it, you know, it's, there was like, that's, and that's a barrier. And for what, right? So they decided, you know what, lunch is free. Lunch is free for every New York City school child. And that's, that's something that's newer. It's something that's awesome. We shouldn't be hungry at school if you're nourished and it's, you know, as healthy as, you know, whatever our nutrition standards are, you know, they're, they're okay. But, um, you know, you're going to be nourished. You're going to be able to pay attention, you're gonna be able to stay awake, um, and it's a great thing. And then even in the summer, a lot of schools are open to provide to provide meals. I think we're also seeing something huge going on with 3K. You know, we had pre-K for all, the mayor's expanded seats. I know at the school across the street from me, they went from having like 36 seats to having 150 seats, tons of seats now for pre-K for four-year-olds. And now they've just rolled out um, a little bit broader 3K than last year. Last year it was like two districts. This year it's, I don't know, five or something districts have, um, you know, a, a pre-K program, it's five or six hours for three-year-olds. So we're getting, get, you know, kind of closer touch, right, sooner experience with these families, with these students, get them engaged and, you know, with all these different endeavors that we're trying to do. But it's trying to, you know, reach, reach more people sooner in the city. And the connection with food, nutrition, and phys ed and sexual violence is really direct when you look at the trauma research. Because the only way you're going to know what your body wants in terms of consent, what you enjoy, is if you, you know, haven't deprived yourself of food and also but if you've had healthy phys ed because there is research that links like a lot of like women who do sports oftentimes have a sense of what they want uh, lower eating disorders things like that which is you know who knows the research is actually I've questioned that but nonetheless <laughs> uh, point being different relationship with the body as more than just an object mm -hmm. yeah oh. right over there. So I have a question regarding, uh, so you guys all seem like wonderful people. And my question is, how do I find you guys? Because uh, as a, a person, not necessarily in this school, but back in my old school, I was a peer advisor. I did some counseling. I've done some mentoring. I have, I've had a lot of people who have come to me with these issues. So I haven't had them personally, but I've heard a lot of stories. And I always question myself. Where do I take these people? So yes, I had some resources. I, I knew about the Wellness Center. This was uh, back in LaGuardia. Uh, I knew about the Wellness Center. I knew about uh, reporting to school safety. I knew about reporting to the co coordinator of whatever department what this person had an issue with. And there was this one specific case where um, three women walk into the department where I worked. And they're like, they're obviously upset. And they start like screaming with the um, with the coordinator of the department, which is the boss, the boss of my boss's boss. So they're like screaming with her, and then like eventually, like she's like, "Oh no, get out of here! You're just like screaming or something like that." She handled the situation horribly, um, and they just like walked out, and I walked out after them since I saw what happened, and I started asking them, and they were telling me about. A, a, a sexual harassment case that happened with two of those, uh, two of the three people, mm -hmm. um, and they were like still crying, and they were telling me what happened when they walked into this person's office. And this person is supposed to be someone who who should be able to handle this. Um, and I just like, for the the first person out of everyone they talked to, I was the only one who listened to the whole story. And I was sitting there and I was just thinking of the resources that I could offer them once they mm -hmm. finished their story. And then I offered them their options. And then from then, we went in and uh, reported the issue to school safety, which I don't necessarily think was the best option. But it was, I laid down the options, that's the one that they chose. Mm -hmm. So 
How do I find you guys? Okay, so so here's what you should really do. You should go to response.suny.edu, which is it's called the SUNY Saver Resource. And what they did was we realized that there was no one database with all the information. So what's really cool about New York State is we have a rape crisis center in every county, and that's not true for most other states. Um, and 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 the, our SUNY campuses are very connected to them because SUNY you know SUNY is all over in parts of New York that are six hours away that you haven't even dreamed of. Trust me, I've been to all of them. It's very cold. Um, but it's almost Canada, and then it's like almost Ohio. Um, but but it's, it's very cold. So what they did was we, we partnered, we worked with RAIN, and um, I'm not going to... Uh, Rape, abuse, and... Incest, incest national, national network. network. Okay, so we worked with RAIN. They, we worked with our tech people, and they like gave each other code and data. And then we worked with the New York State Coalition Against Sexual Assault, New York State Coalition Against Domestic Violence, to get all of their like member organization data and we put it all into a website where you can search by school, um, by SUNY school, but you can also search, more importantly, for this for this audience and anyone outside of SUNY, you can search by zip code. And what it's going to show you, and it's all set up to be to work really well on mobile. It's a mobile site. You can use it on regular computer, but it's set up to be mobile. And when you look at it, it's, it's response at SUNY.edu. Um, I'm, right, is, someone should check, make sure that's right. Um, it's called SAVR Saver. Um, um, and so what you'll see is when you search by zip code, you'll see on camp, like local, like on campus resources, off campus resources, and there's little symbols that tell you if it's legal, if it's a, um, if it's 24 hours, if it's a confidential resource, and there's phone number, you know, the name of it, the phone number, the person's name, if it's a title, um, you know, all of that stuff. And because it's like meant to be on mobile, you can just like press the phone number, it'll call, and it'll let you know like the hours. If there's a fee for something, it'll tell you, and um, it's all it's all on there. So it's great because you can search by zip code wherever you are. It also has an exit button on it. So if someone is in a situation where they might, you know, be unsafe, if someone sees that they're looking at that, there's an exit button and when you press it, it'll go to like google.com or something. And then it, there's no, when you go back, it's gone. So it doesn't no sit, yeah, there's no history. Some people call it a boss button, um, but it's really a safety, a safety feature. So SUNY built that Anyone can use it for free. You know, we've worked with other states to talk, talk to their you know state university systems about how they can build it for their state and make it a resource that anyone can use. What's it called? Uh, oh, so it's called S A V R Saver, and I think it's response.suny.edu. But that's, you have to. You have, it is. You know, you got to work with your tech people, even though they're like, you know, they're in that basement, you know, with their headphones on. But no, they are. They are. They are partners in sexual violence prevention and response. Yeah. Right. And, and another resource too is NYC Hope, which is which is um, all of the Office to Combat Domestic Violence has put this um, resource together, and they just launched it what two weeks ago, I think, three weeks ago, uh, and uh, it's all of these resources around dating violence and uh, domestic violence. Um, all in New York City, so it'll show all. There's a place to get resources of all different organizations that are that are around too. So it's on the service the service provider side. Yeah, and I would just add that if you really are interested in training, I and mean, we have a network of five family justice centers here in New York City, which are specifically uh, focused on intimate partner violence um, and sex trafficking survivors, although there's so much intersection with all the issues that we're talking about, and they have trainings every month um, that talk a lot about the issues we've been talking about, and also just in terms of like how to engage with people, which I think is sometimes one of the hardest things if you think something's happening to even just have the tools it sounds like you did a good job Amazing. in the moment um, but people sometimes don't do what you did because they don't feel comfortable engaging they don't have sort of the words they want to use so um, and it sounds like your friends with Paula so I can make sure you can be connected <laughs> with their office um, and we can let you know what's going on if you want to come to events and participate because well, the more well the yeah area. with with Paula I know that I can come to Paula for this yeah. it would be either you or Diana yeah. and so I was just gonna, I was getting to that that um, <laughs> the Women's Center for Gender Justice is there for that very specific reason everybody who's in my cohort of gender justice advocates anybody who volunteers there and even federal work study students who work in our center are trained for bystander intervention are trained in all of this and you can and we are confidential we are are not allowed to say anything unless you choose to have us say something. So you can come to us, you can come to anybody in our center because we have an LGBTQ coordinator, we have an LGBTQ counselor, and we have a regular counselor there that offers services to everybody. And we also have 
resources up the wazoo for everything, <laughs> for intimate partner violence, for domestic violence, even if you want financial literacy, you can come to the Women's Center for Gender Justice, L67. <laughs> also, another issue that happened with that specific scenario, and uh, they later explained to me that uh, my boss's boss's boss was trying to sweep it under the rug, and it was because, like, they once they mentioned the, the name of the specific professor, I remember that, like, three weeks ago, I was at his retirement party. So like all sorts of like sabbaticals and tenures and this person was not getting fired. That's why they were trying to sweep it under the rug. So Mike, four. Does anybody have any more questions? I can talk all day. <laughs> you would appreciate it, correct? Okay. So 610, I know he has another engagement. Yeah, he has another engagement. Does anybody have any more questions? Um, I just wanted to invite you all tonight to um, the gallery. Um, there's an art exhibit going on. There's an opening till 8 o'clock. Um, it's called Violated Bodies. So if you have a chance, walk around to 11th Avenue and check out the art um, exhibit. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, panelists, for really taking the time because you guys are amazing. Okay, thank you, guys.